Hi, I'm Nina Gradia, and I'm a somatic experiencing practitioner on the non-dual path. And I have here with me Aloshan, who I'm very happy to have with us today. I'm going to have him introduce himself in a moment, but I just want to share how Aloshan and I have met about, um, let's see, January. So about a year ago, I had a somatic school with people all over the world coming in online, and um, Aloshan had you know, registered for the school. And um, he was the most interesting, you know, student there. He had so much to share with us about spirituality and how it applied to the somatic work we were doing. He told me about his teacher, Ryan, who is a non-dual teacher who also uses somatic work on the path to liberation. And I was just so excited. I'd never met a non-dual teacher or heard of one that really talks about the somatic aspect of this work. So, I got to ask Aloshan, can you please, please ask this teacher if I can learn from him also? And Aloshan very generously, you know, made that request. And then Ryan honored that, um, or he he graced me with his teachings. And it's been history ever since. But Aloshan was his first student, and I'm his second student. And we may reference Ryan throughout this interview, but Ryan would like to be anonymous. So he's just asked us not to name identifying information about him, but we'll just, you know, call him by his first name. And I'm really so excited for this interview because I want to lay out some of the structure of how I was taught through Ryan. And um, and Aloshan has, you know, he's transcended that structure and he's going to just be speaking from direct experience as I ask him questions. So Aloshan, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. You're welcome, Nina. Uh, hi, guys. I don't have too much to say about myself. Um, I started looking into the mind many, many years ago, uh, looked into different philosophies and theory of identities and uh, stuff like that. Just try to try and see what suffering was about. Uh, I had a had a feeling something was going on. I, I lived in relative comfort yet my mind didn't seem like it was comfortable. So my journey started on, on that. Uh, I jumped onto Reddit uh, in the stream entry subreddit and that's where I met Ryan. And um, yeah, we spoke for a while and um, he was very scientifically oriented. Uh, he dropped a lot of the religious uh, dogma around it. Uh, and he told me what he believed the truth to be so i asked him for the no fat version of the truth without anything else anything mixed up just tell it to me as it is and he did and it took me almost a year to come to grips with that truth and another two years to actually understand it uh, but in understanding it all questions that i had have been completely answered so there is not a single flame in me that burns anymore when it comes to seeking. It's all completely done. Incredible. Yes. So this is an opportunity where I get to ask Aloshan anything. And he is also now a repository of information like Ryan, where he'll just be answering from his direct experience. And so some of these questions I'm going to ask and, um, you know, just get Aloshan's way of explaining things, which is really cool. <laughs> so some of these questions I'm aware of, some of them I'm not, some of them I want to go deeper, and some of them I'm asking because I think viewers will be interested. And um, it's really neat how Aloshan answers these things very specific. And so I, I think you'll all get a lot out of it. And then at some points I might um, clarify it to make it a little bit more um, accessible for complete beginners. So, um, so Aloshan, can you um, tell us, well, hold on, before I do that, let me, let me outline the structure very briefly before we go into questions, how Ryan had taught us. So first is self-realization, which is knowing who you are, okay, and that is knowing it conceptually. So it is, you know, an intellectual knowledge, but, but that's the only you know, intellectual knowledge that is needed, the knowledge of who one is. And then there can be experiences, direct experiences of this knowing who we are. And that could be like non-dual awareness or otherwise 
spiritual experiences where people feel that they they see the truth and they know who they are but these experiences can come and go and so we can't be an experience so that can't be who we are so when these experiences are not there if we can hold on to the conceptual understanding of who we are that is something we can cling to to remember when we're not having the experience and so this self-realization knowing who we are can allow the mind to stop. And when the mind stops, we feel this bliss. And I'm sure many of you have experienced this because this non-dual awareness, this is our true nature. We were all born this way. And it's very natural to us. We go in and out of it hundreds of times, but because of conditioning, we've been programmed and the mind starts running and it can, you know, we, we can get hooked in a way that we lose our awareness of who we are. So we can have these realizations of who we are and the mind stops and we feel complete bliss and peace or or maybe just an ordinary you know just awareness but then the moment we have an attachment that arises for us that you know gets the mind going again and running again because our ego is the sum of our attachments and these attachments are held in our bodies as holding patterns as physical holding patterns based on our relationship with ourselves with our feelings so a lot of this actually goes into the somatic work which is what ryan calls liberation work so from self-realization there's a spectrum where we walk towards liberation and so again the self-realization knowing who i am and then whenever the you know the mind stops and then whenever the attachments arise and the mind starts up again we clear the attachments so it's a lot of this is the somatic experiencing work it's very similar i mean it includes it and there's additional stuff but we want to see where am i holding those attachments physically in my body and then i imagine not having the attachments and they see what feelings arise and i clear them and then again the mind may stop until the next time where an attachment arises that I haven't looked at yet. And so as attachments continue to arise and I continue to clear, then we are we may have longer and longer stretches where the mind stops. And then, you know, he's gone all the way. There, there might be a few things that he's never seen and they might come up occasionally, but so he's completely liberated. And so I want to set up this structure so that you can kind of maybe reference that as we interview Eloshan. So Eloshan, does that sound like anything you might want to add to or clarify? No, that, that was that was it perfectly. Um, that's that's my direct experience of how how things are. Um, I will add an addendum to what you said. Um, so the knowing of who you are. So Ryan did this quite. He is quite smart about this. So. As you said, there's two parts, right? There's actual self-realization. So this realization of your true nature, the waking up from the dream. And then there's the actual liberation. So it's possible to be liberated without being self-realized. And it's possible to be self-realized and continue to suffer and not be liberated. So in a lot of monastic traditions and in religions, the monks do the liberation work first. They do the chanting and the prayers and the morality side of things. All of these things are to calm the mind down so that the mind can have the insight of its true nature. And when it has an insight of the true nature, it almost feels like full enlightenment because the work has been done, the liberation's work has been done. There's no attachment to pull it back into, uh, into this false identity. So when the, its nature is realized, that's it, that's the end. This is where this idea of this big bang moment of enlightenment comes from. A lot of people that are doing, uh, doing this are sitting in monasteries for 20 years. They've calmed their mind down significantly. They aren't householders like us who have jobs and go out into the world and have bosses and have a hundred uh, personal relationships throughout the day in which there's thoughts popping up and all these paradigms we need to deal with. They're just sitting, right? So, um, this is why you might hear of, of this big bang moment of enlightenment. And it does happen. It happens, it happened to a, a, a large number of people, but it's 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 rare. It's very rare. So the first thing I want to call out is to, to not get too disappointed if you don't wake up and then never suffer again. All that, that happens for almost no one. Almost everyone wakes up first 
in the Western world, they have the realization, and then there's a period of what I now call integration, which is a liberation, which is simply integrating this new perspective that you've had with your everyday living. You know you are, you are, you are everyone, are you treating everyone like they are you? Do you see a difference between this mind body unit and, and another? If you are in a parking lot and you can see a mind body unit would be better off in that parking spot than what this mind body unit would be, would you give that to them? Not because they are superior to this mind body unit, but because they are the same. Are you living your life in this way? If you're not, then it's just spiritual ego talk. Then it's just, oh yes, I'm self-realized. I know I am Brahman. This is of no value to yourself or to the world. So um, I guess the one thing I did want to point out, circling back to, to what you said, was that, yes, there is the self-realization component, the understanding, conceptual understanding that you can get from discussions with someone who is enlightened or awakened through reading the text, through just general interest. You can get the understanding of this, and most people don't even have the interest to get there. So this is already a massive step, just having the curiosity. You can have the understanding of that, but there is a moment in which you wake up. And that does not come from any knowledge. It does not come from any understanding. It does not come from anything you've read. It is called transcendent knowledge. It is the knowledge that hits. Now, the reason I'm outlining this separately is because I don't want to confuse your viewers or confuse anyone else. Because this knowledge that hits, it is not possible for you to get it. So there's no steps you can take so that, yes, this knowledge will hit. This is why it said enlightenment is an accident. It is given to you by grace. It will either happen or it will not happen. When it happens, I can tell you my direct experience of it happening to me. I was sitting in the lounge here. And I was listening to Rupert Spira's video on why does God allow suffering? I already knew the answer to it, but for some reason I was listening to it and I was folding clothes or something. And my mind just stopped. And I realized that I was dreaming. And what I meant by that is, I'm not sure if anyone here has had the experience where you're sleeping in your bed, dreaming, don't know you're dreaming, and then suddenly you're like, oh, I'm dreaming. You remember you're dreaming. In that instant that you remember you're dreaming, every one of the entities in those dream, in, in the dream, turns empty. You see that they have no identity. You see that there's only one true identity, and it's the mind. It's the mind of the brain that's sleeping in the bed, dreaming that dream. In that one instant, you realize that all of your dream characters are just dream characters. There's only one real character, that's you, and that's the body sleeping in the bed. It was like that. I woke up and I was like, whoa. I was dreaming. This mind-body unit, this mind-body unit here, Alotion, is empty. Everything around me, all these objects, they, they, there's no substance to them. There's nothing in them. And I remembered who I was, but not as a being or as a, as a form of some kind. I just remembered who I was as infinite consciousness that was dreaming, that had forgotten that he was dreaming. That was known in an instant and everything stopped. This did not come from any, anything that I read. It did not come from what Ryan told me. It, it, this experience came from absolutely nowhere. So I want to make clear that that is something. That is an experience that happens that is the only thing in the entire spirituality in which there's an actual flip of a switch. There's a night and day difference. There's not this ambiguous, oh, did this happen to me? You know you woke up. That happens. Now, the reason I say Ryan was smart is because this is given by grace. What are you going to do? Say someone wants to experience this or wants to be fully enlightened. What are they going to do? Well, are they going to just sit around and wait and hope that it hits them? What if it never does? So it's, it's more skillful to get the conceptual understanding and then just act like you're enlightened anyway. 
get the conceptual understanding. By luck, it may hit you, it may not. But then use the fruits of that understanding, which is the labor of that understanding, the integration of the life to live your life in that way. In that way, at the very least, you had the conceptual understanding. You didn't have the grace to be hit for some reason, but you are now living your life as skillfully as possible because you have not trusted someone who they said they've been licensed. They say, look, you might not have my understanding, but through my understanding, this is the best way to know. So because of that, you now have the conceptual knowledge of I am all things. You then, through your daily life, you live like you are all things. So you integrate this understanding into your daily life. And one day, you might, it might hit and everything will solidify. And, and you're already living that way anyway, so. Or it might never hit. And worst case scenario, <laughs> you have a deeper understanding of your mind than 99% of people and you are suffering less than 99% of people. That's the worst case scenario. So that's the point where I'm at. So that is where I believe Ryan's teachings were coming from. And it's the reason he never mentioned transcendent knowledge to me for two years. He never told me it existed. And when I asked him why, he said, what purpose is it? And this is how you know when someone has the zero ego here. Imagine holding infinite transcendent knowledge, <laughs> speaking to someone for two years about this, but never mentioning that you had it because it simply wasn't relevant to the conversation. Incredible. That is true egoless. Yeah, I, I've tested Ryan in so many ways. Like he's the real deal. <laughs> he's totally liberated. Um, I just want to pause you, Aloshan, because I want to um, catch everyone up who might be a beginner about some of the things you have um, spoken about here. So when he says mind-body unit, so my mind and this body would be Nina, right? And, and this is not who I am in entirety, my true identity, which is this infinite consciousness that he was referring to. And that's one you know, it's it's one being, it's the infinite consciousness, which is within you, which is in me. It's almost like there's this octopus with all these tentacles, with all these little cameras at the end of these tentacles, all getting different images and different, you know, um, perspectives. And, but, but it's all one being, you know, so it, it's this oneness that we're not separate that he's talking about and living in integrity with that understanding. So we can have the conceptual knowledge that I am all that is, and I'm one with all that is, or oneness and, you know, lack of separation, however you want to think of that, I am the absolute. And then you, you might just know that intellectually and not be walking that path. Can you treat a stranger the same way you would treat your best friend or your mother? And that is walking in integrity. So Aloshan, can you tell us more about um, what it means to know who you are? Can you tell us about like somebody who is new to this or somebody who has not had the direct experience? Um, how would you explain this to a beginner? Uh, it, it would be very difficult to explain this to a beginner. Um, how I'm just I'm, I'm all I'm I precede all things. I, I I don't know how else to say it except for my direct experience is that. So when you wake up from the dream, the eye shifts to everything. And this everything is not a form. So what happens sometimes is that there's this immature thing that's, that sometimes hits the mind uh, when you wake up. You wake up and you realize what you are the mind immediately tries to make that into another form because that's what it does. The mind is a meaning making machine. It's conceptual. So it tries to go, oh yes, Brahman. And then it tries to put that into another form. But if you are mature enough in this understanding, you'll, real, you'll throw that away too. You realize that that's the trick of the mind is to try and put you in this box. You realize what you are is infinite potentiality. It's formlessness. It is the very nature of what you are is formless. It's formless because for anything to have form, it means it's finite. And for anything to be finite, it has to have form. So my direct experience of who I am is not anything I can point to. It's something that precedes all things. It's, sorry, it's not even something. It's no thing. 
it's, it's not a thing. It's formless, infinite potentiality. The closest I could guess you could say is quantum form would be the closest in, in scientific terms. Just infinite potentiality of bubbles. That that's that's how I directly see. I precede all things. I am I am before all things. That's yeah. just that's my direct experience of myself. I, I, how now? How do you translate that to a beginner? You you'd have to actually do neti neti. You you'd have to first have the desire to find out who you are, which means you'd have to have discovered that hey maybe I'm not this mind body unit which means you probably would have had to suffer a bit first if you're sitting in the Bahamas and you're just enjoying your life. Very, very unlikely that you're going to question anything about reality. So you're going to have to question something about reality first. Then you're going to be like, wait a minute, things don't seem to be the way they are. Uh, so then you start going, okay, you look at what's causing suffering and you realize that the linchpin of suffering is identity. When you realize that, you realize that the question, who am I, is a massive question and changes everything. I'm going to pause you. I'm going to oh, go ahead. What was that? And that's when the path starts. Yeah. OK, so I'm going to try to um, make that um, simpler for beginners, some of what you said. So so neti neti is I'm not this, I'm not that. So what we do is we kind of look at things in the world. And you know, if I am looking at this bottle, I can't be this bottle because who's the one looking? Right, so that's an easy one for you all to see. So anything I look at, any object in the world, I can't be that. But what about my hand? You know, if God forbid, if I lose my hand, am I still Nina? So if I can look at this hand, I can't be this hand either. I can't be this body. At what point, how many things do I need to lose in this body before I no longer have this Nina-ness or I'm not Nina? So then we start looking at internal experiences. Well, the thoughts are coming and going and you know, they're, they're always impermanent, but here I am always watching, uh, able to observe these thoughts. So who is the one observing? I can't be the thoughts, which are form. So form is like, you know, th this matter. And I, the thoughts are form, even if it's not visual, it's still an object in the sense it's an electrical impulse. I just cannot visually observe it, but I'm able to observe it with my awareness. I'm able, with my attention, I'm able to watch my thoughts. So again, I cannot be my thoughts. I cannot be my emotional experiences. Emotions come and go. But if I have sadness in this moment and I'm experiencing that, does that make me a sad person? Is that now my identity? Or am I a person who's experiencing sadness in this moment who may then experience anger in the next moment? So I can see, oh, my emotions are always fluctuating, but I can observe them. The one who is looking is staying the same. So again, I can't be that. And so what is that one thread that is holding me as Nina or, you know, prior to Nina, if we're labeling Nina as this mind body unit and mind is temporary, body is temporary, who is this Nina? And that's where we're talking about this infinite consciousness. And so when we are doing neti neti, we're, we're kind of trying to ask like, who am I? Like, okay, I can't be this mind if I can look at it. I can't be the emotions. I can't be the body. You know, the body has all different cells than a year ago. The body looks totally different than when it was the baby. When I die, the body will be here, but the essence of me will be gone. I cannot be this body. So who am I? So he's, he's talking about like really exploring that question and doing your own investigation, not blindly believing something conceptually, but really looking in your direct experience. So um, I think there was something else to clarify there too that I can't remember, but I, I think it'll come back around. So yeah, do you uh, want- mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's really important that um, people approach this with a skeptical, critical view. So to not believe anything I say or anything you say or anything Buddha says, or anything that they've read anywhere or any YouTube videos, it can be nice landmarks and signposts. But what's actually happening here is you are unraveling the labyrinth of your own unique conditioning and mind. No one can tell you exactly what levers to push or levers to pull, buttons to push to see through this illusion. You literally have to look into your mind and see where those knots of self-placement and identity are, where those knots of illusion are, and un and unknot those knots through awareness 
and wisdom. You have to do this. And only those, those specific knots only exist in specific minds. So it's not like someone can say, here's a book, do this, you shall become enlightened. It's literally the unraveling of your own conditioning. So this is why I agree with what you say, where it's just, it's best to take advice from someone like yourself, speak to other teachers, but everyone ultimately is walking their own path. And if, if they find landmarks and signposts that don't line up with what some people are saying, that's not an indication that they are not walking the correct path. Absolutely. It's about understanding who you are, but it's also understanding who is this false self for this programming that you have gone through and identified with, and that is going to be unique to everybody. So these knots that he's referring to, it's like either de delusioned, uh, delusional thoughts or identification with thinking that this is who I am, identification with certain identities. You know, he was talking about creating this prison for ourselves and it's a prison of identification, who I think I am. All of these attributes that I think are me, I can think I'm a female, I'm of Indian descent. And, you know, on a relative level, these things are true. But if I really think that that's the end all be all of who I am, I've severely limited myself from identifying with infinite consciousness. When I identify here, I have not put any limits on myself at all. And then I can identify as this unlimited potentiality that he mentioned earlier. Anything below this, I'm a female, I'm of Indian descent. Any of these things actually limits me. It puts limits onto my identity. Now I can use those um, identities practically in relative reality while being very aware that I'm just infinite consciousness playing a role here in this body as Nina. And as we identify with the true self, we actually lose all of the conditioning and pain associated with that conditioning from identifying with a lower identity. So for example, I think I'm a female and then I perceive certain injustices with females, and then I'm going to start feeling the pain of that. And, you know, and, and all of this can really be bypassed, not, not in a, um, not in a way that we don't want to feel the feelings that we might have felt experiencing the different limitations that we felt we had experienced. We do need to unload all of that. But if we continue to identify at the highest possible place, we're not going to be creating new pains. We're not going to be identifying in those ways that we're going to start feeling constriction around um, these places where we'd put our limits on ourselves, that th there don't really have to be in the way we identify in our minds. The world might treat us still in certain ways, but we don't have to identify. We don't have to buy in to this dream. How does that sound to you, Aloshan? Yeah, I, I completely agree. I thought that was very skillfully said. Yeah, so... Um, maybe I'll just ask you some general questions. So what would you say is emptiness? What would you say is isness? Can you tell me a little bit about those terms, how you think of them? Emptiness is lack of isness. Uh, isness would, to me would be the core essence of something. So emptiness to me is a lack of isness or identity. It's something that's difficult to explain because it's an insight that happens. It's the core insight of Buddhism and it's, it's, it's the same insight as self-realization. So emptiness is just, so self-realization is just emptiness extended to self. So emptiness is understanding so remember I said when, when, when you were in a dream and you say you're sleeping and you, you remember you're dreaming, in that instance, you realize that, that everything around you is made up from your own mind, that it's all empty, that it doesn't actually have any of its own existence. That's emptiness. That's realizing that in all of the things here around you. But the mind is geared towards not seeing reality that way because the mind is geared towards survival purposes. It does not care about what is true it does not care about reality it cares if you can survive and reproduce that that's the only so whatever frequencies you are getting from the sound whatever wavelengths of light you are getting whatever perceptual other perceptions you're getting it's only relevant to your survival it has no truth value to it mm -hmm. um so so because of that um 
we need to investigate reality using this mind, but investigating it while understanding its limitations. So we start pulling apart things to see its nature. And we start pulling apart ourselves, we start pulling apart thoughts, we start pulling apart sensations. We start looking into objects, we start discussing with people, we start speaking to teachers. As we pull apart things again and again and again, it is revealed to the mind that nothing seems to have any essence or isness or core to it. It all seems to be devoid of anything. Uh, as you said, at, at what part do you remove Nina until there's no more Nina? That begs the question, what is Nina? What in that is Nina? Seven years ago, the same cells weren't there. What's Nina? You know, so those questions make you wonder, what, what is the core of things? This leads to the realization there is no core, that it's all empty, that it's all lacks identity, there is no isness. This emptiness extended to the concept of self, of small self, of ego, means that you see this mind-body unit as empty as well. It means you see this mind-body unit as conditioned as well. It means you see the sensations that appear here and the thoughts that appear in this mind as conditioned and empty as well, just happening like the rest of experience. When that is seen, that means there is no one here to resist. Suffering is resistance. When there is no resistance, there is no suffering. This is how the inside of emptiness leads to the end of suffering. So let me see if I can explain that in a different way, just for people who are new to this. So if this bottle, I think this is a bottle, the, the essence of this is bottle. But the thing is, you know, you know, I can pour the water out of this and in thousands of years, this will have degraded back into the earth. Even now, you know, quantum physics has shown that there are particles of this bottle that are going in and out, uh, appearing and disappearing from space, from, from nothing, something is arising. And then how do I know that some of those molecules that are appearing and disappearing are not appearing and disappearing somewhere else? It seems like this bottle is separate, but in fact, we've just labeled it separate. When if you look over the course of time, it's going to become part of the earth. It's going to become a molecule of something else. And so for something to have isness or identity, it has to have duration. And the only thing that has duration is the absolute infinite consciousness, whatever you want to call it. If you look at over thousands of years, cities arise and cities crumble. And if we you know, zoom out as far as possible, what is the one and only thing that has duration? It's it's all there is, <laughs> and that's the only identity, you know, that, that we can really give to something. So, because, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Am I able to just jump in? No problem. Go ahead. Um, I found it helpful, and you know your, your students better than I do. I found it helpful to start from zero. Uh, what I mean by that is, I don't even know if this is a bottle. What's a bottle? That's, that's, that's the sound that I'm making. I'm making the sound bottle. What is that? That refers to a concept in my mind. What does that refer to? At no point in time have I ever known anything. Every time I say I know something, I'm simply referring to other words about that thing. When I say this bottle is made out of plastic, that's just another word. When I say plastic is made up of certain carbon chains, that's another word. I can go all the way down to atoms. But atoms is another word. I can say atoms are made up of quarks, up, down and, up and down quarks. That's another word. We don't have the capability to actually know anything. We, we cannot know because we, we, the mind and, and the games we play are just language games. We can only point towards things. We can never know what something is. So when you realize this, you stop trying to know what anything is. So at this point, you empty. You don't even know about this absolute infinite consciousness existing. You just know that you don't and cannot know anything. That is when you surrender. When you surrender, then the one thing you can know, the only thing you can know that doesn't come from experience, make it, which is transcendent knowledge. 
The only thing you can know is who you are. You can't know anything else. You can't know what any of this is. You can't know what reality is. You can't know how long it's been going on for. You can't know anything about time. You can't. There's only one thing you can know. And to be honest, knowing that one thing answers all the other questions. It's who you are. And that doesn't come from experience. That comes from transcendent knowledge. So I found it, um, as we said, it's not skillful to wait around for the knowledge, but I found it uh, helpful from a scientific perspective to be like, I assume nothing. There's no such thing as absolute. There's no such thing as infinite consciousness. There's no such thing as anything. There's, I'm not making any assumptions. I assume nothing. Let me see if I can figure out what reality is. And through doing that, I realized that I can't. That every single thing in reality, I can never know anything about. It is the collapse of that that then allows this concept of infinite consciousness to organically arise, as opposed to just being another concept that's tacked on. If you, if you can see, see what I mean. Yeah, when you say concept of infinite consciousness organically arising, are you referring actually to a concept or are you referring to the experience of it or how would you describe the knowing of it to our viewers that's that's a <clears throat> that's a very <clears throat> it's a very important and a very good question and something that i've honed into quite deeply because so that's an excellent question um it is an experience but it's it's a knowing experience so the only thing I can equate it to is like is realizing something when you see an optical illusion, and then in one second, in one instant, something happens in your mind, and then you see it the other way. No new knowledge had entered. Something happened, and it just flipped. That that flipping is an experience. The knowing that it flipped is an experience. Beyond that, I haven't looked too much deeper into it because it wasn't important. Once I knew who I was, everything else collapsed. All the need for all, everything else, all other questions just died immediately. And it, it's the knowledge that kills all, that put, kills all questions. Yes, that, that's what I want to ask you. Is it because the the knowledge is so self-fulfilling that there's just no need to ask questions because there's no more feeling of lack or of this not knowing? How would you? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's not having a feeling of lack because I am all things, but it's also understanding the, the inherent limitations of this mind-body unit and understanding that what a bottle is or what this earth is and these things are so, this, these things are not even a tiny dust in my eye as Brahman. This entire universe is not even a, a dot to me. So it's, I mean, I could be curious about it, but it's not important uh, to me because all of these things, these concepts, these words, these forms, as you said, anything that is anything that is not into the consciousness limits you. It's it's form. I'm not interested in anything that is limited. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you mentioned objects, and I just want to clarify that for people who might be new to this. So that could be again like like the form that things you know are in, like matter, and then being the subject, you know, is is where we're looking from. So, you know, we are the subject in this subject object relationship and and that's at one level of awareness. And Aloshan, you explain very well the different levels of this work. Um so I'll I'll maybe get you started, but if I really like how you explain it. So, there is like this intermediate level and then there's a further level of knowing who you are and so I'll I'll kind of get started with the definition around, you know, being the observer. So if I'm identifying as the subject and all things are other things are the object, then that's like witness level consciousness. And it's this intermediate step where, you know, I still think that, you know, th there's a me and it's the smallest form of ego there is. 
but that's really an intermediate step that a lot of people skip and oftentimes spiritually bypass to you know the next level but Alicia would you mind you know kind of talking about those layers a little bit I, I think that would be a great guide for people yeah uh, I'll attempt to it's, it's difficult from um, from top down um, yeah so the layers you're speaking about it, it's an imaginary halfway point called I am of being it's what a lot of religions and people get stuck at because um, the mind has this desire for permanency. It, it, you'll see that in everything it does, it just wants it to be permanent. Every action you take, it, it has a desire for permanency. So, so because this mind has a desire for permanency, and you start this process of, okay, who am I? And you're looking around, okay, I'm not this, I'm not that, I'm not this, I'm not... Wait a minute. There's this thing here. People call it awareness. And from my experience, it's always been there. From the time I was small, when I was growing up, I felt like a, a Nina. And then as I got older, yeah, I had different thoughts, but there was still this kind of center to me that I felt was the same. And now it's 20 years later and I still feel the center. That's what I am. That's, that, it's the I am. Let, let me close my eyes. So if I close my eyes, Oh yes, there's a center. It seems to be the center and these thoughts and images are coming out of the center and these sensations are happening on the center. And the center is I am. It's just that I've been caught up with all of these ideas and thoughts and I thought I was this body and all of this, but I'm actually this, the center, this I am. That's wrong. That is the halfway point that many people need to get to. Because as you said, it's the lowest form of ego. I, I, I don't even like saying lowest form because it's all ego's ego, right? But it, it's, the, it's the, I would say it's the least destructive. At least you're not identifying with anything else. You're identifying with this feeling of pure being. So um, to me, what the I am a halfway point is, it is giving the mind a chance to unstick from all of these other juicy concepts and thoughts and ideas that are coming up and put attention on just the feeling of bare existence, just the feeling of I exist. I'm, oh my God, I've done this entire uh, investigation of myself with reality. I've read so many books. I've spoken to so many teachers. I don't know what's going on anymore. I'm just going to throw everything away. What am I sure of? What am I 100% sure of throwing everything away? Existence. Whatever I do not know, I'm sure of one thing. The fact is, I exist. What I is, I don't know. Where I am, I don't know. What existence is, I don't know. But I exist. Can I confirm this? Yep, I exist. Finished. That is the I am. That feeling of existence is the I am. Now, when you get to that, you're like, I found it. I found it. This is it. This is I am. This is, must be this infinite consciousness people are, people are speaking about. And you, you get happy because you're like, this is the center. This is something that's familiar to me. It ticks all the boxes. It seems to be constant. It seems to be eternal. It seems to be changeless. It was with me since I was younger. Things seem to come out of it and go back into it. And I watch all these videos and people speak about being and I am. And in Hinduism, it's all about I am and I am and I am. you like, this makes complete sense. So then when you go to your teacher and he tells you, no, that's not it at all. That's very, very disappointing. Trust me. <laughs> when, I, when I was told that, I was like, I, I don't want this anymore. I don't want anything to do with Buddhism. I've spent two and a half years on this. You I, I don't want this. I don't want this. And I walked away, but it wasn't my choice. There is no me here. It just continued happening. Um, so what happens is that sensation, that sense of being, when you throw everything else away and you're only left with that sense of being, you rest in that. Because you don't know anything else to be true. You've seen that everything else is empty. Everything else is changing. Everything else is dependent on concepts and words and there's layers of experience and there's permutations and there's all these understandings and there's videos and teachers and but this one thing here you can be anywhere in the world and all you have to do is close your eyes you don't even have to close your eyes 
You can just be aware that you are, that I am. Now what happens is people get stuck. They get drunk on this feeling. They fail to see that just like all the other sense impressions that came up, the I am is another sense impression. They fail to see that just like all the other thoughts that came up, the I am is another thought. They miss this because the mind is so rabid to want to attach to something so it can become a form of some kind so it doesn't die. That as soon as it finds this constant I am and it ticks all the spiritual boxes, it latches onto this and people get stuck here for the rest of their lives. They still identify with something, so they're still limited. Now, what Ramana said, Ramana said, if you sit in this sense of existence, now I am, continually just sit in it, anything comes your way, throw it away and return back to it. Just like all illusions, this feeling of I am will also dissipate. When I say dissipate, I'll be clear. The raw sense data that's making up the sense of I am will still exist. It's just interpreted differently. It's not seen as the center anymore. When that I am or being is no longer seen as the center, there is no center. Everything just is. You are all things. Everything comes from you and falls back to you. That's Brahman. And that you've told me before, when you're at that level, you can look inward and see you, that you are no thing. And then you can look outward and see you are everything. Is that right? Yes. So at that, so you've already looked in doing Nessie Nessie for years. You've already looked and you confirmed that there's no part of your experience that you can be. So in that way, you are nothing. But when you look out, you, if you've had the realization of your nature, you can see that all these things around are empty, that there's only one identity here, and that identity is you. Not the mind-body unit, Nina, but infinite consciousness, you, which means right. you see you are everything. In right. between those two, your life flows. And that's what Niska meant when you said. Yes, I, I want to um, kind of summarize what you said in a very simple way for beginners. I think of this in three different levels. The first one where most people start out where they might identify with, you know, it's the ego identifying with these different, you know, aspects of myself that are temporary or even other people and in a very codependent sort of way. So the, the ego identifying with things that it is not. And then we can go to that intermediate level where we start to see like, wait a minute, that, that, you know, I, I'm, I'm not those things. So like knowing what I'm not is very important to not just feel blindly identified to everything around us. So that separation can be very helpful. And then once we go to that third level where we're like, oh, well, because there's, there's no ego or we've seen beyond it, maybe there's some there, but we can see it like it can, you know, kind of sit down and then sometimes it comes up and so we can see when it's there and when it's down and we see that oh I'm actually nothing then I can look out and see that I what I have in common with all of existence you know what, what does all of existence have in common it's this infinite consciousness and and I am everything does that sound in alignment with what you're saying Aloshan um, yeah it, it does um it so what you're saying is not wrong, but it's very, I understand. That it's very needs, simple. I'm trying to just, yeah, but, but please, very, please expand. Very please, it's, yeah. I, it, 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 like, I just want to uh, make sure that your, your views don't get the idea that this happens in such distinct steps. And No. <laughs> and they're like, okay, so step four didn't happen. Maybe I'm doing something. Like, it's all over the place. Right. Honestly. Very like, nonlinear. Yeah. Yeah. You could have like a really high level realization. And be completely egoic the next day. It's it's honestly yes. a lot. It's not it's it's not like a continually easing up. I agree. Very um non-linear sort of journey with this. 
many people they they go all the way to the top in their understanding but then they skipped that intermediate step right and they, they need to come back to integrate properly that's very common and then as you said many people get to the intermediate step and they just get stuck there they don't know there's something beyond that because a lot of the teachings out there stop at that midway point yeah a lot of the teachings don't even mention anything past the midway point uh, and for good reason too because it's difficult to even get to the midway point. It's difficult for the mind to even calm down enough to disidentify with the sense of existence. That itself is, is, is difficult enough. There's so many things going on all the time, so many somatic reactions, so many thought patterns, so many identities calling for your attention. Just to identify with the sense of existence it is a win to me. So like not putting anyone down who has gotten to that point and if, and if that's all they get to, they are already above most other people. They already reduce their suffering by 90%. If you can just identify with the sense of I am, that's 90% of your suffering. Though. How would you describe the sense of existence to people um, with the felt sense, feeling-wise? You know, you, you mentioned it regarding um, conceptually, but when you are asking people to identify with that, what does that experience look like? I can't answer that because I, I, I've seen through the, uh, the sense of existence is an illusion. So I, it's just, to me, it's just seen as sense data. So it's just seen as pressure against specific points in this body and sensation that are arising, not arising from any specific body or on a, a body, it's just arising. So every, there's just phenomena that's arising and it's all empty and conditioned. So I, I can't really, you kind of asked me how to describe an illusion. I can't quite remember. It feels like exist. It feels, I would imagine it would, from memory, it would feel like existing, like that I exist. But then the mind will quickly take that eye and point the eye towards something. Now there's no thought of myself. There's just, the happenings so yeah. do you do you think that illusion is similar for different people like that sense of existence that that eye is pointing to something similar in each person um there's this one person you you sent me his videos i forget his name but um I, one of them was fantastic where he said if you're if you feel like you're identified with like you like you're the head almost like you're you're looking from the head and that's where the you is like then ask who's the one watching that and as I did that even that dropped away and that was incredible and I wonder if for some people it's it's pointing more there um how would you say about this experience I, I know we can only really speak for ourselves but I'm curious your thoughts about it um yeah I would say um I would say it would it would be quite similar for everybody. This, this is why the sense of existence or I am is such a central teaching because it's something that a lot of teachers are scrambling for a commonality they can point to because all we can ever do with this is point to things. We can never, we can never, we can only point. We can never actually show. So um, this is an experience that has commonality through it. Everyone can understand what it feels like to exist. If they are able to at least quiet their mind for a few seconds, they can appreciate that there's a sense of existence. There's a sense of I am. Yeah. And this and it doesn't need to be qualified by anything. You don't need to explain that to anyone. You don't need to go and yes, people can think of words to use to describe that experience, but no one is in doubt of whether they have that experience. You ask any of your students about the sense of existence and say, yeah. You ask them to describe it, that might take a bit longer but it's there. So the, the experience is similar for a lot of people, but the thing that you were speaking about of who is the one that is aware of that and stepping back and going back and back, that is just done as a mechanism to collapse this entire concept of a one watching. Mm -hmm. So the only reason that you are asked to look for a thinker or to look for the watcher or to look for awareness 
is to make you realize that there is none. That the only, so the mind, so this is where it gets a bit different from other things where this part basically is, who am I? I don't know who I am. And you start down this journey of trying to discover who you actually are. And you start netty netty, I'm not this, I'm not this, I'm not this, I'm not that, I'm not that. And as you continue down this path, you get to a point of, okay, I'm at the I am, but then you realize this is another concept and you kind of get this, the mind in the habit of not letting anything stick to it. So the mind starts a very sticky. There's a lot of identities that stick to it. But the more you do netty netty and the more you say, I'm not this, I'm not this, I'm not this, I'm not that. Eventually you'll even say, I am not the I am. I can see that I'm not the I am. That understanding and conviction and experience of seeing that you are nothing that can ever appear in your experience means that that habit of Oh, I must be X starts to, starts to drop away. And when that habit raises its head, a teacher will say, oh, ask who is the one that is, is, is watching that. Not because you can actually ask that, but just to remind the brain, hey, look again for the one that is saying that and find that there's nothing there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that's all that instruction is. Hey, look again and see that there's nothing there. Hey, look again and see, hey, because you seem to have forgotten, you think there's something there, look again nothing there that's all that is yeah some people say that the i am signifies i exist just that inherent experience how does that 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 feels slightly different than what you're saying do you agree the i am so when you say i exist but i which is what, right. what is that I pointing to when you say I exist? Right. That would be the first question. What is that I pointing to? Two, yes, in Hinduism, especially, the I am or being is seen as a reflection of Brahman. It is not seen as an illusion. It is simply seen as a reflection. So it's not the sense of existence exists. There is something that exists. It's not saying that there's not, sorry, there's not something. There is existence. There's not things in existence. There is existence. That is not your question. Right. It's the existence gets conflated with this false I existing. And those two are equated. That's what the issue is. So in a lot yeah. of religions, that I am or the being is seen as a reflection of the ultimate source. And you can rest in that. It's fine. But it's 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 to be noted that this is this is still a concept. I am and being and existence is still a concept. A concept is only mind. You are beyond all these things. These are all frivolous things. They are nice steps to get you there, but in the end, they mean nothing. Yeah, I wanted to bring that up because when talking about these things, um, people need to be aware of like what is that word pointing to and oftentimes we use the same word that can point to different things so i'm i'm glad we clarified that um because in one way it can be the reflection like what you're saying in one way if the eye is pointing to that false illusion then that's still going to drop away so um I, I think that was really helpful to clarify so um so a lotion is very familiar, as are most of my viewers, with my trauma chart, where we talk about, you know, having thoughts, and when I buy into a thought, it's going to create an emotion physically as a sensation in my body in real time, and then my relationship to these emotions, if they are, you know, ones of resistance, like fear, dislike, trying to get rid of it, Suppress it, suppression, then I'm going to push it down and then it can store in my body as holding patterns. And then we've worked on the liberation work. And, and I, I just bring up that, that chart and that information because there's another layer to this. 
that I learned from Aloshan and Ryan about feeling tones. And Aloshan, I'm wondering if you could explain to us a little bit about feeling tones and then maybe also how that can be maybe put into this context in the chart. Okay, I haven't uh, thought I know it's been, it's been a year since you saw the chart. Yeah. <laughs> so that's okay if you don't remember, but maybe just describe feeling tone and then I'll, I'll put it in um, yeah. after you describe uh, it. Even feeling tones itself has kind of melted into, so, so when you, all of this work starts is, is divided, right? You divide things into sankaras and feeling tones and perceptions and fasas and uh, you divide it into all of these things so you, your mind can intricately look at all of these things. But then as you continue down the path, all of as your understanding deepens, all of this kind of just merges and melds into just kind of just the experience and the acceptance of the entire experience. So forgive me if I'm not very articulate in explaining this. No, it's okay. I, I can start actually in a very simple way and, and maybe that will take you to you know, so uh, the next step. Uh, it's okay. Um, so okay. from my experience, uh, a feeling tone is, so we, we have an object. Um, so you, you have an object that, that you see in front of you. And that object exists, right? Oh, sorry, we're not speaking about existence and what exists. And, and simply from our experience, our relationship with the object, it's there as an object. Now, dependent on how the mind is conditioned, there will be a, a reaction or a feeling tone that arises when this object is seen. So an object exists there. The mind sees the object. Light, light rays hit the object reflected back into the retina, an image, an impression, a sense impression is created in the mind. When the sense impression is created, there's a feeling tone that's attached to the sense impression. Now this feeling tone is not inherent in the sense impression. This is what I mean. The average person, chocolates are much more, more, much more appealing than snakes. Snakes and chocolates inherently are not bad or good, but, for a normal person, they would prefer to see a chocolate and they would not prefer to see a snake. So if there was a piece of chocolate in front of them, light hits the chocolate, reflects off, goes to the retina, image of chocolate, sense impression appears in the mind. This mind-body unit, through its experiences as a baby and through its mom and dad, loves the taste of chocolate, loves the texture, has many good experiences. So there is a positive, feeling tone placed on chocolate. Now this mind body, this mind doesn't see this. It just feels, oh, chocolate, happy. Now, say it sees a snake. In the past, it's as a child, maybe it was chased by a snake, it got bitten by a snake, its parents tell it how bad snakes are. There's this entire evolutionary reason why human beings are afraid of snakes. So this is this deep limbic fear as well of reptiles that exists within us. So then the snake is there, light hits the snake, enters your eye, forms the image or an impression of a snake, fear is overlaid on top. But we don't see the overlay. The mind sees the snake and the fear as one thing rising together. So it sees the snake as a fearful object. It identifies the snake as fearful. Then the somatic reactions start. The somatic reactions of constriction, of the sympathetic nervous system starting up, the dry mouth, the heartbeat, that will then inform thought. Something's going on here, you need to think. Thoughts will occur, will inform more sensation, and then the cycle will just play. So the, the freedom from this is realizing that the objects that you see, while they might feel like they are negative or positive or whatever feeling tone appears in your body, they are inherently not anything. They are neutral. They are not good nor bad. This meaning is placed on by your mind through conditioning, through whatever circumstances that you had no, no dealings with whatsoever. It was not your choice to like chocolates and hate snakes. This is just the world you grew up in. Because of that, your mind automatically sees something, places feeling tones. As soon as it places a feeling tone, there's something called a sankara or a reaction that occurs. 
that Sankara reaction is that somatic reaction, is all the nonsense that starts in the body and mind that, that just serves to further make this object more fearful or more pleasurable or whatever it is. But the freedom of the mind is seeing that you choose the feeling tone that you put on the object. Not initially, initially it's conditioned. Initially, you'll see a snake, you'll be scared. But if you see a snake enough and you watch the mind closely and you have the awareness to see the mind take snake and put feeling tone of fear on top of snake, that feeling tone of fear starts to lose its, its power. It's not that there's no feeling tone of fear, but it's kind of seen through. It's seen as it's not really important. So then the mind over time, over long periods of time, the mind stops attaching fear on top of snake and just sees snake. Could you clarify a bit more about the deconditioning process? Yes, the, uh, so, so when, now when I'm speaking, I can only speak about my experience. So mm -hmm. I can't speak about a process. I'm not even sure if one exists. I'm sure some teachers will give you one. Mm -hmm. uh, from my understanding, it's all of this is coming about by ignorance. The, the mind is ignorant. It's simply not aware enough that these things are happening. So it's everything is automatic. There's just too much automaticity. There's just there's just snake fear reaction, more thought, more sensation, more thought, more sensation, more thought, more sensation, fear, 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 fear. It's just nonstop. So you just need to slow everything down to see what's going on here. Hey. If it's skillful for you to be afraid right now, be afraid. But don't be afraid because it's it's your habit to be afraid. That's not skillful. You know what I mean? So the deconditioning process for me is literally going into what I realized some time ago that might not sit right with a lot of people, but it's it's how I see things are. There is no such thing as morality. There is no mm. such thing as good or bad. These, these are things imposed by the mind. There is skillful and there's unskillful things to do. So if you want a certain outcome, there are skillful actions to take and there are unskillful actions, but there is no evil and, and good. There are no good thoughts and bad thoughts. They, these things do not exist. When you understand this, when you see a snake, you don't see a snake as evil or bad or dangerous. You just be like, hmm, I'd like to continue living. It is not skillful for me to walk towards a reptile and poke it because it might bite me and I'll die. It's just a skillful decision. So now your responses and your idea and the way you think about things is not informed by fear. It's informed by skill. And it also removes the judgment aspect of it as well. A large part of my childhood was me feeling like I'm not good enough or I feel like I'm doing the wrong thing. When you realize there is no wrong thing, then the judgment part is completely gone as well. However, I have to say that caveat to this is that I could throw away morality completely because I know who I am. Because I know who I am, I treat everybody like me, which right. means I don't need to think about good or bad right or wrong because I treat everyone like me. This can be very dangerous for someone who has not realized who they are. Absolutely. And then just walk around and going, hey, there's no such thing as right or wrong. I'm going to do whatever. That's dangerous. They're totally ignorant still. So they're capable of hurting people and doing things yes. that are not skillful. Yes. Yes. Well, once you get to the understanding of your true nature, you can throw away all morals, all right or wrong, all of these things that have been weighing you down, all of these judgments, you can throw it away and just live in the moment. Because our true nature is so peaceful. I want to add, because the nature of it, it, it nothing, you know, horrible is going to happen <laughs> because that, because of our true nature. I, I know that is a thing that's, that's people like to say. I'm not willing to make any statements about our nature, except that it just is. It's my experience. Every time I've gone deep enough, it's just been peace. That's and what so, most, that is what most people's experience is as well. Yeah. But, but thank you for that. I'm going to try to say this in a simpler way for beginners. So, um, you know, in, in my chart, I talk about how, so I think about something, I buy in, and that causes a feeling. So if I think I'm not good enough, I'm going to have a feeling that gets produced from that. 
Now, what I am hearing from Eloshin regarding the feeling tones, and we, we've had several discussions about this, and it's still ongoing, my understanding of how he's explaining it. So Eloshin, please, you know, guide me if this doesn't seem exactly correct. But my impression is that the way this differs from a thought creating an emotion through belief is that this is like an implicit response that occurs that, you know, occurred when we were young and due to our conditioning. And so when I see something, it's not even that I have to have a thought about it. I, I just see a snake and, and with it comes this impression. It, it's just colored with this impression of like a little bit negative or a little bit positive and a little bit of fear, or a little bit of excitement with the chocolates. or, and, and that's just part of the inherent conditioning. But there's not this, you know, through a belief of mine that I'm creating this impression. Okay, so so, so that's subtle, the subtler than so you're yeah. correct. So it is still a belief there. There's just a belief you haven't uncovered yet. But yes, oh. it, yes, you, you're 100 percent correct where it's it's much deeper. It's way, way deep down. But now it's it's not about attacking that belief. It's about bringing those sensations when that belief occurs and being aware that it's just a belief in your awareness. Repetitively doing this will weaken that condition because you can't go back 20 years, right? So all you can do is when you see the snake and there's fear there, hopefully the snake is behind some kind of enclosure so you're not actually are not in danger. Instead of, oh my God, snake running away, let me put YouTube on, let me try and get away. No, sit down, now's your chance. Feel what you call to be fear in your body. Feel it completely. You know that there's no danger. Now is your opportunity. Feel it. Feel it while being aware that this is a habit your mind has done. It's just play fear on top of snake. You do yeah. this again and again and again and again and again and again and again. Eventually, the mind will see a snake and it won't place fear on top of it. It will just see snake. And that's what enlightenment is, seeing things as they are. Yes. So would you say it's still a two-part process in the sense of disproving beliefs, even if it was not an actual fully formed belief, it was just an impression before the mind was even, you know, be, when we were pre-verbal, before the mind was even having self-talk, that it was just this impression. And um, this impression, you know, maybe formed some sort of belief that just wasn't verbalized, but the belief was, oh, snake, bad, you know, and so do you, would you agree that it's still this two-step process of disproving the beliefs as well as feeling through? that overlay, that emotional part? I don't think there's a need to go so deep into it because that differentiation is not so clear. So as you said, it's subtle. It's so yeah. subtle, it's not even worth calling it a, a two-step. I called it out because when we learn something about the mind, it is wise to be aware of what we have learned, to let that sink in. So the awareness I want to arise is that the snake is not inherently good or bad. I just want that, that, that idea to swim in there. You don't have to make it a part of a system. Okay, I'm breaking out of disbelief. Just be aware that this feeling that you have about how evil the snake is and how terrible, it's just a condition thing. Just be aware. You don't have to do anything with it. You don't have to think differently. Just be aware that I can look at it. I can see that this, this, is, a, this is a snake, man. It's, not, it's inherently not evil. It's just existing. Just be aware that your mind is placing things on things. That, that, that's all. At what time the mind will stop doing that because it's aware of it. Yeah. Yeah. And the body is also conditioned, you know, towards survival. So the body might have these automatic reflexive actions, you know, just towards. Yeah. It, it, it does. The entire dorsal vagal complex and everything, it, it just does. The entire body constriction. Um, the, there's a lot of stuff that happens in the body that will further inform the mind. Now, if you don't have a grip on the mind, the mind will eat that up as evidence that there's something wrong. They'll say, see, I told you. I told you that you're in danger. Look, look at your heartbeat. Look, yes. look how much you're trembling. I told you you're in danger. And then, then the body goes, oh my God, the mind's right. So then, and it's just the cycle. And now suddenly, the poor snake sitting there, relaxing in the sun, not even thinking about you. And you here with this amazing machinery this this brain that took millions of years to evolve and you're just imprisoned by it 
That's what I yeah. see. I look around and I see millions of human beings with this amazing machine and they get it and they're just in prison. Absolutely. It's, it's such a cycling back and forth. I've been doing a lot of work on uh, death the last few years. And um, I remember just a couple of months ago, my mind was just completely at peace. And I just thought of death just to test where I was at with that. And um, the mind didn't freak out at all. It just remained completely at peace. But I could see very clearly the body reaction. It was just conditioned in that way, but it was actually quite minimal. So it was really easy to see, oh, it's just an automatic body reaction. The body's supposed to be afraid of death. This is a mechanism that keeps us alive, but you can decondition exactly. it and, out. Exactly. Yeah. And, and there's this idea as well that people who get into non-duality or, or realize these things, they they try and not be a person or lose their personality. They, they make non-duality or not being a person into another personality. So they'll even stop using the word like I, and it's, yeah. it's actually it becomes very difficult to speak to them. It's yeah. just an ego trip. It's not yeah. helping anyone. It's not explaining <laughs> anything to anyone. This is them. I am so empty of all preference. I'm so empty of. It's just another ego trip. So I find that it, it, you know you're on the right path if you can see how less of a self someone has. The more self someone has, uh, the more the more deluded they are. Uh, I have to go shortly, but okay. I wanted to quickly run through, uh, I guess, my understanding of this path, because it just appeared in my head and I thought, why not? Mm -hmm. And also something else that might help your students or might not at all, you probably already know about it, but it's something that actually helped me quite a lot. And then I just want to read something uh, to you as well. Sure. Uh, it should take about 15 minutes and then yeah. if you have questions, and then I'll Sounds have good. Okay, so, uh, so this process for me from the very start would be realizing that in the Western world, we usually have a roof over our head. We have food in our stomach. That's all you need as a human being to learn. This idea that we need everything else is just an idea, it's just that. To me, a person who needs much less to be happy, just needs a roof over the head and a bed, is much richer than a person who needs a massive house and all these cars and all of these things. So what I found, chasing after external things brought some fulfillment, but it didn't fulfill anything deep inside me. So then I started looking at why. It seems like I have everything I need. Why am I not happy? Because this is the goal of life, right? It's happiness, apparently. Why am I not happy? I have everything. I've ticked all the boxes. Why am I not happy? It seemed to be that there was an issue with my mind. There was an issue with the way my mind was interpreting phenomena. Now, this seemed to be because of my childhood, a uh, large amount of trauma I went through when I was younger. Uh, my parents, uh, ethnic, uh, not to speak for all ethnic parents, but my parents are very old fashioned. And I find in ethnic communities, there's a lot of, there's a, there's a way they deal with their children that is a bit different from, from other communities. Um, so I, there's a multitude of reasons, but the issue was is that there's nothing wrong here. It was my misperception of things that was the issue so i needed to see how things were so i could correct my misperception and hey if i perceive things correctly and they're still really bad that's fine at least i'm now perceiving it correctly right so i started to look into my mind i started to look into my mind and then i realized that the linchpin the thing that was causing suffering was the one that was suffering so i saw that the linchpin of all suffering was identity so then I started to speak to teachers, people who claimed they were enlightened, stream entry subreddits, look into Buddhism, psychology, the mind, thousands of hours of meditation myself, trying to look into the mind. And with that, the chipping away of this illusion of a fixed entity, of a self moving through time started to happen. And as this illusion of a self chipped away, 
the awareness of how things actually were grew. As the awareness of this grew, this incrementally shipped away even more of the self illusion, which grew the awareness even more, and it created this positive feedback loop where now the self is seen to be a complete illusion, and most of the pain and suffering that I see in others are coming through this illusion of the self. So it was simply about dismantling that. Once I had worked on the mind, I found, as you said, that there was also a self in the body as well, that there were conditioned patterns in the body that were informed by the mind and also tried to pull the mind back in. So then I started to work on the body as well. But because I'm not identified with this mind or this body, it's much easier to work on it. So the rest of my journey now is simply watching the mind, watching its play with the body, and then working with these condition patterns in the body and the mind to relax it to its natural state so that the actions that it can take in the world are not right or wrong, but are most skillful to its situation. That is where I'm currently at at this point in time. That's a great outline. Thank you. My um, body work that I found amazing and I'm not sure if you've heard of Samadhi. Samadhi means union with God. So as you meditate, and as you get deeper and deeper into meditation, things start to happen. The, the sense doors start to close. The sense object starts to close. The mind starts to go inward. You've heard of heart rate variability as well. You've, I've been using that in a in a uh, health heart sensor. I find that if I sit completely still, one, I find that if there is no pause at the end of the out breath or at the start of the in breath, which is two, and I find that most importantly, if the exhale is longer than the inhale, that will induce heart rate vari variability in under three minutes consistently. And you can keep it there. For me, meditating, the hardest part is when I'm doing this, my mind is just thinking thoughts, this, this, this thought. It can't do any of this. But for this, I'm not trying to not stop. I'm, I'm not trying to stop thinking. I have only one purpose here. Make sure exhale is longer than inhale. That's it. That's the only goal. So simple. Exhale being longer than inhale. You do this. You take an inhale. And then exhale. Make it slightly longer. There's no pause. Another inhale. Exhale slightly longer. You, if you don't move your body. So if you sit completely still. And you make sure your exhale is longer than inhale. Those two things. The mind will start to calm down. The body will start to calm down. This is what will happen once, once it calms down. Just, just to give you an idea of what's in store for you. All right, this is what I'm talking about, right? So, so you need to, firstly, you need to engage in some kind of morality or cleanliness. There's no such thing as morals, but try not to murder people, steal from people. Generally, if you do those things, you're gonna have a lot of thoughts, right? Try to have a shower, eat, clean yourself. If you've got dirt everywhere and you're stinking, probably not going to be very centered, right? When you begin to meditate, you start with pranayama, which is the breathing I spoke about. One rule, exhale longer than inhale. The goal of pranayama is to get what is called the fourth phase of the breath, which is very shallow. After this, the, the mind naturally begins to withdraw the sense organs unto itself. The next step is to have a one-pointed intention. A one-pointed intention how long enough results in dhanya or meditation. This is, a, is absorption. Meditation held long enough can slip into samadhi, of which there are two main types initially. Savikalpa and Navikalpa. The Savikalpa results in a oneness with the divine, but not a complete realization. And this is what people can get lost in. 
Savikalpa retains recollection and reasoning. So you can still remember and reason and know you are having the experience of the divine, but I'm not burst into it. Bursting in, into it is Navaka Samadhi, and that is the total cessation of the mind. And when full realization occurs, neither of these involve awareness of the body, which fully disappears in Dharana, one pointed focus, and sometimes in Pratyahara, control of senses. <clears throat> Full liberation is the integration of Navalka Samadhi into your daily activities. Both involve the true bliss of the divine, which is even partially revealed in Dharana or Dhanya usually. So it's basically about making sure the exhale is longer than the inhale and sitting still enough in which you'll notice that after about 15 minutes, your breath is like that, and it goes to this. It's almost like a flutter. Like you almost not breathing. You almost not breathing. And then it will slowly, slowly withdraw. And then all these sense data will stop. There's only the inside. And then even that will go. And there'll only be the sense of you meditating. And you continue that sense goes, and then there is only infinite consciousness, Brahman, what you are. Thank you. May I ask you one quick final question? Um, what do you think about the value of, you know, what you just said right now is withdrawing from sense perceptions, and then there are non-dual practices of going fully into sense perceptions you know, fully hearing or fully seeing or in the sensations with equanimity without putting attention on thinking, losing attention, losing interest in thinking and going into non-dual in that way. I'm just curious about what you think of the value of that compared to what you just mentioned about withdrawing from them. The withdrawing from the senses portion of what I mentioned was simply to get into samadhi. Uh, samadhi is just an experience that I don't mention to anybody and why I've never mentioned it before because people can chase after it. They can chase after it like it's a drug of ecstasy and bliss. And they completely miss the entire world. Um, so this withdrawing into the senses is just to reach samadhi. Um, it's, it's not something you have to do. Um, the approach of moving fully into phenomena, to me, is only skillful and purposeful to if you need to investigate reality to find out who you are. After you know who you are, you can go play in duality, you can go play in non-duality, you can investigate reality, you can bask in sounds, or you can withdraw whatever whatever you'd like to do. I, I, yeah, I don't think it really makes sense. Okay, well, I just wanted to ask, because Ryan spends his time with 25% uh, attention on visual, 25% on auditory and 50% on body sensation. So it's more like this mindfulness in non-dual and he does that all the time, except when he needs to go into thinking, you know, for work and different things. So I just was curious about that is because I, I've i tried to do that a lot and it's been wonderful, you know, to be there. And then when the mind kicks up again and then, oh, what am I attached to? And let me, go into the somatics of that, clear that, and then boom, go back into non-dual. So I'm just curious yeah, what you thought um, of it I, in that context. Yeah, so uh, so Ryan, this is something I did with Ryan as well. I had an image of Ryan in my mind, cookie cutter, enlightened person, has these qualities. So if I can replicate these qualities, then I can get, he'll tell you this now. I spoke to him the other week. He had 10,000 thoughts. He was woodworking or something. Thousands and thousands of thoughts. The other <laughs> you have like two thoughts. So the entire freedom is being able to morph into whatever is needed in the moment. Yeah. So if you just need to move into your mind to think extensively, do it. I find it more pleasurable to be in the body, to just be, to not, to not think of it. That's me. But as I said, there's no right or wrong. So whatever, yeah. whatever is pleasurable to you, in terms of what's skillful towards practice, not getting lost in the story of the mind, especially in the identity of this mind body unit, is the most important thing. But that's mm -hmm. not even, once again, this is not even right or wrong. If you want, no one's even saying suffering is wrong. 
if you want to suffer, suffer. There's, there's no issue with it. There's just saying, if you don't want to suffer, here is the way out. Right. If you want to suffer, enjoy yourself. There's no problem. No one is even saying suffering is a bad thing. There's no such thing as bad. When you bad, good morality, right, wrong, all of these things can be thrown away when you know when you know who you are. When you know who you are. So I just want to clarify that for viewers. So what he's talking about, him and Ryan, and they know who they are. And so for I, I think it can be skillful for people who are on the path and trying to, you know, investigate who they are. But but ultimately, yeah, you're free. You know, when you know who you are, you're free. You're free to think. You're free to not think. You're free to, you know, to just be. So yeah, yeah, you have to know who you are because if you, yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, I fell back into us having a conversation rather than for the audience. Of your no, no, it's, it's okay. <laughs> that's, that, that's something I probably would not say to someone because a mind that does not understand what I mean will take and use that to hurt other people and to its own advantage. Yeah. What I did want to say, if you can place your attention on two parts of the body at the same time, this will quiet, quiet your mind down extensively. Oh. So any two modes I of like perception, that. whether it's one right hand, left hand, whether it's nose, stomach, any two modes of perception. Now you'll find initially, for me, it's quite difficult. You'll, you'll be like, I only can pay attention to one thing. At how am I supposed to do it? But somehow it develops into it. Now I can pay attention to both. Now there's a scientific reason for this. I will send you the video. I'm not sure if you've heard of this person called Forrest Natson. Uh, oh, yes, he's got a YouTube channel. Yes, I know who that is. Yeah, it's great. Right. right. So he speaks about HRV and scientifically how to get into Samadhi. And, oh. and why putting attention on both parts, any two sense points at the same time, tends to just quiet the mind. And I actually use that throughout my day. So if while I'm walking, I put my attention on my feet and my breath, and the mind is just quiet. Uh, when I'm starting out to, when I'm doing pranayama, I'll put my attention on both hands, and then I'll just make sure my exhale is longer. No, no hold at the end. Inhale, exhale longer, and and I'll just do that. Um, so he is the guru. Of one of my okay so we we got lost in conversation but we're back here now and um Aloshan, thank you so much for sharing with my viewers today i'm so happy i've been wanting to have you on for a while and i'm so glad this worked out um can you tell us where people can find you if they want to learn a little bit more about what you're sharing uh yep so my videos are mostly uh for me uh well they were for me um just to kind of drive the point home and then I found some other people who are getting uh, value from them. Um, so my channel is Infinite Formless. Uh, and we'll, we'll put a link in the description box yeah, below yeah. so people can find you there. there. And there's, there's just videos about self-realization. Is that just much? There's not much about liberation, but um, it should help those who are trying to, I guess, get deep into their mind and then find out who they are. OK. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, everyone, I encourage you to go over there. His videos are fantastic for if you're interested in, you know, what he's talking about in a deeper way. He breaks down each subject in, in short videos. And so I think you'll really enjoy it. Okay, thank you so much, Alishan. We'll see you next time.